One of the things the president had made clear is that we really did have to go after bin Laden. And uh, I remember uh, sitting down with people at the CIA and saying, well, what, what, where the hell is this guy? Uh, it's been over 10 years. And they said, you know, we've, every clue we've gone after, every lead we've gone after has led nowhere. We don't know where he is. Could be in a cave, could be anywhere. And I said, well, look, we're going to form a task force. And we are really going to focus on uh, developing ideas as to how we can get uh, to bin Laden. And uh, I really was tough on them. Uh, the old, uh, you know, you, you got to beat them up to make sure they're doing the job. Our goal was to go after bin Laden. I said, I want you to come in and brief me every week as to what's going on. And I do not want you to come into this room and tell me we don't have anything. That's unacceptable. I expect you to come in here. And if you, if you can't, if you don't have anything, I want five new ideas about how we can try to locate them. So they did, they, to their credit. Uh, they came up with all kinds of ideas. We finally had a great uh, lead, which was the couriers to bin Laden. We were able to identify who they were. Uh, we identified their faces. Uh, and we actually found them in a town called Peshawar and tracked them from Peshawar in, Af in Pakistan to a place called Abbottabad, where we found this compound. And once we found, saw the compound, we knew something was up. Uh, this was a compound that was three times the size of other compounds, had 18-foot walls on one side, 12-foot walls on another side, bob wire at the top. Uh, we knew there was high security there. Uh, we identified a family, uh, that there was a family living on the third floor that resembled a lot of the members of the family of bin Laden. Uh, and so we really th we thought, thought we had a great breakthrough. When the president says we, got, you know, we really should conduct this operation. We've decided on uh, using the SEALs uh, commando raid. Uh, two teams of SEALs, two helicopters going in 150 miles at night into Pakistan to go after this compound. Uh, it was a hell of a mission uh, and very risky. And uh, you know, frankly, when we were in the National Security Council, a majority of the people National Security Council thought it was too risky. Uh, I thought that we should do it. I recommended that to the president. Uh, and the president, to his credit, made the decision to go. So I'm at CIA. Uh, we are conducting the operation from CIA because it's a covert operation. I'm in charge. Uh, Bill McRaven, who's head of special forces, is located in, uh, in Afghanistan. And he's tracking it from there. Uh, the helicopters go in. We, f we track them uh, into the compound. And then something happens that, uh, you know, <laughs> it's one of those nightmares that you, you wonder if it's going to screw up everything. One of the helicopters goes down. It had been hot that day, and heat from the ground stalled one of the engines. Uh, but to the credit of that pilot, uh, he was able to set down the uh, helicopter. Uh, the tail was up on a wall. And uh, I remember saying to McRaven, what the hell's going on? He said, don't worry. <laughs> he was cool as, cool as a cucumber. He said, uh, don't worry. I've got a backup helicopter coming in. Our, our special forces are going to go in. They're going to breach the walls. They're going to keep going with the mission. And I said, God bless you. Let's get it done. Uh, there was a moment of silence, uh, actually almost 20 minutes of silence. We heard gunfire at the beginning. We don't know exactly what's happening. I, I know there's gunfire that tells you something. And then about 20 minutes later, it's probably the longest 20 minutes of my life, uh, McRaven comes back over uh, the uh, uh, communications and says, I think we have Geronimo. Geronimo was the code word for locating uh, bin Laden. Uh, and we all kind of tensed up. And there was a few more minutes, again, the longest in my life. And he comes back and he said, we have Geronimo, which meant they had bin Laden. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they got bin Laden. Uh, they put him on the backup helicopter. They put all of the people on, back on the helicopters. They all got the hell out of there. Uh, they blew up the helicopter that was on the ground. That woke up the Pakistanis. Uh, and uh, we were worried that the Pakistanis might uh, try to stop uh, the helicopters, but uh, they, they didn't do that. We were able to get out in time. Uh, they made it back to Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, I think, I, I remember when 
when the president made the announcement, uh, and I, by the way, I, when I was at the White House, you could hear people outside the White House yelling CIA, USA, USA, CIA. And I never forgot that. I thought that was, that was just a, a moment where America f really felt good about what had happened. And, and look, the fact is we sent a message to the world that nobody attacks the United States and gets away with it. It was you know, all, of, all of the work uh, by all of those people involved in the CIA and in special forces, all of the all of the sacrifice, all of the risks that were taken in order to do that mission. I suddenly felt all of this has really paid off. And, and you know, there, it was a moment when I thought about the victims of 9-11 and their families. And I really felt that those families are going to embrace this moment probably more than anyone else because we will have gotten uh, the individual who killed their family member. Well, there wasn't a lightning bolt. Uh, it wasn't St. Paul, <laughs> you know, suddenly getting a, a lightning bolt out of the sky. It was really something that grew on me for several reasons. One, because I'm, I'm the son of immigrants, Italian immigrants. And my parents used to always emphasize that it was important to give back to the country because what the country had given them. Uh, used to ask my father why he came all of that distance to, to this country, uh, leaving family. Uh, it was a poor area of Italy, but he had family, he had you know, people that he related to back there. Why, why would you do that? And I never forgot his response, which was that the reason your mother and I came here is because we really believed we could give our children a better life, which in many ways is the American dream. Uh, so because of what this country gave them in terms of the opportunity to kind of work hard and succeed, and, give their children a better life. They used to always emphasize the importance of giving back to the country. Uh, secondly, when I served as a uh, lieutenant in the Army, uh, the experience of working with a broad cross-section of people from across the country, and that was the case. I mean, in those days, because of the draft, you had people from everywhere across the country that were part of the military. And the experience of working with them and finding that you really could come together on a common mission in terms of duty to the country and accomplishing that mission, working together as a team. That really inspired me uh, about the importance of, uh, of really being able to work together to achieve a, a mission. And then lastly, you know, John Kennedy is president, young president, who said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I was really an inspiration. And at that time, public service was really a higher calling. And I really felt that way. Yeah, I, I was very close to my nonu. Uh, that's what we, we, like we called uh, grandfathers uh, in Italian, my nonu and nonna. Um, and my grandfather had come over in 1938 uh, my grandfather was a big guy. Uh, he was over six feet. Uh, he had been in the Merchant Marine and used to sail, he sail around the world in the old sailing ships. I mean, I, I, I remember now, I, when I went to Australia as uh, CIA director and Secretary of Defense and going to Sydney that my grandfather used to talk about how beautiful Sydney was, and he went there in the old sailing ships and uh, came to Monterey, visit my mother, uh, actually did some fishing in Monterey. And then uh, the war broke out. And uh, my grandfather uh, was not allowed to go back to Italy. So the, the one thing he did, because both my parents were working in the restaurant, my father was the chef, 
uh, and my mother handled the cash register. And so my grandfather basically took care of me, uh, you know, and my brother. Uh, my brother was a little older, so he was, you know, out running around in the neighborhood. Uh, we were in an Italian neighborhood, so everybody kind of took care of each other. But uh, my nonu really took care of me, and he used to walk with me. He used to put me on his shoulders, and we'd go down to the ocean together. And then suddenly, because of the war, a decision was made that because he was an alien and he wasn't a US citizen, sounds a lot like the problems we're having today, uh, there was a decision made that he might be a threat to national security, and aliens like him might be a threat to national security, so that they, had, they were required to move inland. Now, you know, they didn't set up uh, camps like they did for the Japanese, thank God. But the fact was that my grandfather had to move away from the family uh, because of that requirement. And um, I, I was asking myself as a young boy who loved my grandfather, my nonu, I said, what, why is this happening? And my parents really didn't have a good explanation. You know, they were, they were trying to figure it out as well. So, but I do remember driving with them and my grandfather to, uh, to San Jose, uh, and we were able to locate a, a boarding house in San Jose where a lot of other Italians had to move to, and leaving him, and I can't tell you the impact that that had on me as a young boy uh, leaving my nonu. I never forgot that experience, uh, and I, I guess it's the first time as a young boy that you experience that something's not right, that in this country where you're kind of growing up and enjoying life and going to school and you, know, you have kids uh, that you, you, you grow up with, uh, you don't really think about whether you're different. Great thing about America, then, frankly, is that you know, we all grow up together. But then suddenly when something like that happens, not because there is any kind of security justification here, but it's because you're Italian and you're an alien. Uh, it's, and it's what happened with the Japanese, obviously. Yeah, I think, I think we are, we are, I deeply believe, and it's not only because I'm the son of immigrants, but I think we're a land of immigrants. America's a land of immigrants. I mean, my God, our forefathers were immigrants to this country. Uh, pioneers were immigrants. We had immigrations from across the world. So our fundamental value in this country is that we respect people because of who they are. There is, there is a dignity associated with people, no matter where the hell they come from, whether they come from Italy or Ireland or Germany or Asia or, or Africa, wherever the hell they come from, they're human beings and they deserve our respect and they deserve the dignity of being a human being. And America has been great about that. I mean, we, we are a country that has welcomed immigrants and it's what, what's made us strong. We are a strong country because of immigrants who have come to this country and now claim America as their land. We're strong because of that. And that's what the Statue of Liberty is all about. I mean, the Statue of Liberty so basically were... makes the point that we are a nation that welcomes people to this country. And now my fear is that we've kind of turned that around. We've turned that on its head. And suddenly, the, the values that I thought were so important to what makes America a strong country you know, we're beginning at the highest levels to reject some of those values. I think that's a bad mistake. I'm talking about the travel ban, I'm talking about DACA and these young kids uh, who are, you know, they're not guilty of anything. Uh, you know, maybe their parents did come here uh, in an undocumented way, but why should the children who are innocent you know, bear the penalties for, for what their parents, the sins of their parents. I mean, that's crazy. And these kids are getting an education. They're, 
They're growing up in this country. They're getting jobs. I, you know, we have those kids in the military who are serving in the, in, the, in the U.S. Army. And they're putting their lives on the line for this country. Are we suddenly going to make the decision to deport these kids? That's crazy. That's not what America is all about. Because of the experiences we just talked about, I, I really got very interested in civil rights. Um, and when I got out of the Army, I went back to um, work for a U.S. Senator from California, Tom Kuchel, who was a kind of a progressive Republican, came out of what we call the Hiram Johnson tradition, which was a progressive Republicanism uh, reflected in people like Kuchel and Earl Warren and many others. And that's what I was. I was basically a kind of progressive Republican. So uh, went back, and Kiko was working with a lot of other progressive Republicans, people like Javits uh, from New York and Case from New Jersey and a number of others. And they were working with Lyndon Johnson and Democrats on civil rights legislation. And I was asked by the senator to kind of uh, staff him on that issue. So I worked on civil rights legislation. And you know we, we, we were able to pass some landmark bills as a result of that. So when I. Uh, uh, when, when Kiko's defeated in a primary and I'm um, looking for a job or deciding whether to come back to Monterey, uh, I was uh, offered a job in the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare by uh, Bob Finch, who was another moderate Republican who became Secretary of HEW in the Nixon administration. And uh, because of my work on civil rights, I ultimately became a director of the Office for Civil Rights, enforcing civil rights laws, uh, particularly with regards to uh, to education, equal education. And a big focus of that, obviously, was on the South because uh, uh, children had been divided by race for almost 200 years. And black kids went to black schools and white kids went to white schools. And that's what the, Board of the Brown versus the Board of Education was all about, was the decision that a separate education is inherently in unequal. And so uh, I was required as director of the Office for Civil Rights to go into these school districts and make sure that they were breaking down the dual school system and taking steps to desegregate these schools. And, and we were making good progress. Problem was that Nixon had cut a deal with the South uh, in what was called the Southern Strategy. Uh, he was worried about Rockefeller when he was running for president, uh, Nelson Rockefeller, who was a moderate Republican. And so he cut a deal with a lot of the Southerners that he would, uh, he, he would back off of tough civil rights enforcement. Uh, they supported him. It's called the Southern Strategy. And you know I was aware of that, but I, but I really did not believe when I became director of the Office for Civil Rights that we would retreat on an issue as fundamental as whether or not we give children, young children, uh, the right to an equal education. And, and also because Nixon himself had supported civil rights when he was in the Congress, when he was a senator, and he's a Quaker by religion. You know, they believe in civil rights. So I thought, you know, uh, this is going to be tough. We still have, we have this political deal, but at the same time, you know, I think doing, enforcing civil rights laws is the right thing to do. So I was doing that. Uh, I knew there were, there were political pressures to back off, but I continued to do it. And I kind of made that... A very fundamental decision. And I, I tell the students here at the Panetta Institute, you, you may face this decision, which is a decision between whether you do what you believe is right, whether you do something that abides by your conscience, or whether you make the decision that you're not going to abide by what's right because you can advance your career. Pretty fundamental decision that I think a lot of people have to face. And you have to decide, you know, what course do I take? And I remember talking to my wife about that. I, you know, that I, I, I was worried that I was getting a lot of pressure and I didn't know whether, you know, it was going to result in, in my getting fired or, or whether I, you know, was, should capitulate. And we, I kind of made the basic decision, no, I'm going to stick to what I think is right. I worked on this legislation. I believe it's right. I've got to do what's right. Now, part of that is the Jesuits uh, at Santa Clara who uh, you know, taught me about right and wrong. Um, but part of it was just that gut feeling that 
And I, I remember Tom Keekle saying to me, when I first went back as a legislative assistant, he brought me into the room, and it were just a couple of us. And he said, you guys are going to be tempted. Understand that. This town tries to, to, to go at you at, to try to impact on my vote. But I want you to remember that we're here to protect the rights of the American people and the rights of the people of California. And I also want you to remember one thing. When you get up in the morning, you have to look at yourself in the mirror. So remembering what Kiko said, that you got to wake up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror, which is about integrity, I continue to enforce it. Uh, one morning, a uh, newspaper lands uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the door. And we open it up, and there's a... Uh, there's an article that said that uh, this is Panetta, Panetta has resigned as director of the Office for Civil Rights. I hadn't resigned, but you know that was what the article said. And there had been some articles about some speculation about whether or not I would be fired because of civil rights, et cetera. But we continued to reject it. And so I, I remember going to work, uh, going to visit the secretary, uh, Bob Finch. And saying, uh, you know, Bob, uh, there's, there's an article in, in the morning paper that says I resigned, and we're denying it because I haven't resigned. And he said, oh, no, that's the right thing to do. You know, keep denying it. It's just, a, just one of these rumors that, that are out there. I said, fine. So I, I continued to do my work. But then they had, uh, as they do now, a uh, press conference, daily press conference, with the uh, press secretary to the president. And it was Ron Ziegler at the time, uh, working for Richard Nixon. And Ziegler was asked, what about this article that says Panetta has resigned? And Ziegler said, uh, that's correct. He, he has resigned. <laughs> and I said, I looked at that and I said, what the hell's, this, this basically means I'm fired. Well. You know, you're, you're a young person. I think I was only about 27 or 28 at the time. Uh, and, you know, you can see your, your political career going up in smoke. But more importantly, you also worry about your family. I had, I, you know, we had uh, two kids. So I think we had a third child on the way. Uh, so I, you worry about that. But at the same time, you know, when I, I remember getting up at, the, at a press conference at the time and saying, yes, I'd submitted my resignation, but I really wanted to urge the administration to continue the good work on civil rights enforcement. I think it has changed. I think that uh, it's the reason we have the, this Institute for Public Policy is because we're concerned about young people being inspired to give back to the country, to provide public service. And our democracy depends on that. And so uh, I, I've always felt that uh, our obligation uh, as citizens of this country is to, to give something back to the country and to do everything you can to make sure that our democracy is strong, particularly in order to give our children that better life. I think that's what public service, frankly, is all about. You know, it's about the American dream. It's about giving people a better life. Well, my, my father was an immigrant to this country who didn't have a hell of a lot of education. I think at most my father, you know, maybe went through a couple grades of grammar school uh, in, in Italy, you know, if there was a grammar school, uh, he probably went through a little bit of schooling. But most of his life was really dedicated to hard work. And, uh, you know, he fought in World War I and left his family to go to war and often used to describe uh, how brutal war was uh, in, uh, this was the, the battle in the Piave Valley, and I've never forgotten him describing that experience of, of in those days, I mean, having, you know, facing the Germans and uh, 
being under an, an artillery barrage and trying to escape from that artillery barrage. And he, he actually got wounded uh, as a result of that. And I uh, used to talk about that a lot. Anyway, you know, he had, he'd been through some, some tough times. And uh, he, had, he was the 13th in his family. And he had several brothers who came over to this country, you know, like, uh, like many other immigrant families. Had one brother, uh, his oldest brother, Bruno, uh, settled in Wyoming, shared Wyoming. And he then, he had, then had another brother, uh, who was actually close to him, named Tony, who settled here in California. And uh, the tradition when you came over to this country is that you visit your older brother first. And so my mother and father went and visited uh, his brother Bruno in Sheridan, Wyoming. Uh, they spent one winter in Sheridan, Wyoming. And my mother said, you know, I think it's time to visit your other brother in California. And they did. And they made it to California and made it here to Monterey. And uh, my dad opened a restaurant downtown Monterey during the war. And uh, he worked at that job almost around the clock. I mean, you know, it, Monterey was a jumping town. We had, uh, you know, they were catching a lot of sardines. We had the Cannery Row, which was uh, what Steinbeck wrote about, uh, was uh, jumping in those days. But in addition to that, uh, we had a military post called Fort Ord that was training young men from across the country for the battlefields of World War II. And the last stop was Monterey for civilization before you went to war. So you can imagine you know, a lot of soldiers uh, going through Monterey. One thing I do remember is that my parents used to invite some of those uh, young soldiers, uh, particularly the Italian ones uh, from New York, uh, to our house for the holidays. And uh, I remember as a young boy looking at them and thinking, these guys are going to go to war. And uh, I never forgot that, uh, particularly when I did become Secretary of Defense. And I had the responsibility to deploy our men and women into harm's way. I always remembered back to looking at those young men who were celebrating Christmas with my parents. And in just a few weeks would be either in the Pacific or in Europe uh, fighting in a war. My father believed you work hard. Uh, you, you earn money uh, and you spend it wisely. And so he always used to pay for everything by cash. Um, and when I got, I remember getting a, uh, a gasoline credit card for the first time. Those things were just coming out at the time. And I got, I got a gasoline credit card. And he was really angry that I'd gotten a credit card. He said, what the hell are you doing? Why don't you just pay for it in cash? And he, he always believed in cash business. I mean, the restaurant in those days was all cash business. And he believed, you know, people pay in cash. That's the way you're supposed to do it. Uh, you're, not, you're not supposed to do it by credit. Um, so he was, uh, he was a believer in the values of hard work. Uh, you know, you earn what you work for, and then you use it wisely. I mean, you know, my, my parents did not spend their money in crazy ways. Uh, they were very frugal in the way they handled it. I mean, they, you know, they spent it wisely. They didn't buy fancy things. Uh, you know, my father made money in the restaurant. Uh, he bought, after he sold the restaurant, he bought the farm in Carmel Valley. Uh, and, uh, you know, going back to your, your question about remembering him, I mean, I, I remember getting up with him early in the morning, putting irrigation pipes out in the field. And, you know, I, I remember as those fruit trees, we had walnuts, but we also had some fruit trees. As those trees got older, uh, he would pick, you know, peaches and apricots, and I'd hold the ladder for him. And he'd be whistling, really enjoying, you know, the work uh, and the open air. And, uh, and I, always, I always remembered that, you know, he really enjoyed the fruits of his work. The fact that not only those trees, watching those trees grow older, but also 
watching my brother and I grow older, and, and, in, and in many ways, investing in our education. I mean, we're the first kids in our family to go to college. When I got elected to Congress and went back there, one of the things that I learned, and I also pass this on to, to our students, which is that uh, knowledge is power. And if you're a member of Congress and you know an issue better than anybody, that's power. That's power. And the budget was an issue that very few members understood. It's complicated stuff. Uh, the budget process is, uh, you know, it's very complex. Uh, how you put budgets together, you know, how you try to get them passed, what, what do all these numbers mean, et cetera. Uh, but I, I got very interested in that uh, at, when I went back. And uh, I remember getting on the budget committee and uh, really enjoying that experience of working on the budgets because what the budget gives you is the opportunity to see the entire government, to see all of the priorities that we spend money on, and to determine what our priorities should be. And, and frankly, you know, as a member of Congress, Understanding what are important priorities for this country and what, where you want to spend your resources is, uh, is probably the, the most important responsibility you have. When you really look at this stuff and you go line item into every program in a department, uh, which I, I did both as chairman of the budget committee, but I also did it as director of the Office of Management and Budget when Clinton appointed me to that job. You really do look at individual programs and whether they work or not. And the one thing I found a lot were programs that were not working very well. And it's easy to, to pass new programs, but it's very tough to make those programs deliver what they promise. And suddenly, you know, when, when you pass a program, you know, like uh, a program for Head Start for kids, uh, the idea behind that is great. You know, you want to take kids and give them a chance to really succeed in education. But then when you see that some of those dollars are misspent and that they aren't really accomplishing some of the things that, uh, that they're supposed to do, you know, you suddenly become aware of the fact that you can create programs, but unless you really continue to oversee those programs, to make sure that they're working, to make sure that they're delivering on what they should, then a lot of that money gets wasted. Well, I, I am I'm very discouraged by the fact <laughs> that we sacrificed an awful lot uh, to get a balanced budget. Not only a balanced budget, but we had a surplus. Uh, and it took a, took a lot of sacrifice. It's not easy. I mean, these are hard decisions. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna do the right thing on the federal budget, you know, trillions of dollars that are involved in the, in the federal budget, and you're gonna try to discipline that budget, then you've gotta deal with non-defense programs, you've gotta deal with defense, you've gotta deal with what are called entitlements, uh, a number of programs that uh, like Medicare and Social Security and others that provide benefits to uh, people on an entitlement basis. Uh, by the way, that's now two-thirds of the federal budget. Uh, and you've got to raise taxes. You've got to pay for that stuff. And so we, we made tough decisions. Uh, I participated in every major budget summit. I think it's important that we discipline the debt and that we, discipline, we provide fiscal discipline at the federal level, because frankly, if we don't, if we continue to do things basically by borrowing money and by building up what we have now, which is about a $20 trillion debt, who bears the cost for that? Our children are going to bear the cost for that, because that means we're going to we're going to have extraordinary high interest payments. I mean, interest payments 
If we stay on the course we're, we're on, interest payments on the debt are going to exceed what we spend in the defense budget. It's going to be over $800 billion just on, on interest payments. What does that mean? It takes away our ability, our resources, to deal with whatever your priorities are. You know, whether your priority is defense or education or, or, or housing or protecting parks, whatever the hell your, your priority is, we will not have the resources to be able to invest in those priorities. So we'll pay a price for that. And thirdly, it'll undermine our economy. I don't care where our economy is at, at that point. But ultimately, when you're paying these high interest payments, when you're losing the public investment part of, uh, of our budget, it's going to impact on our economy. You cannot have a strong economy. You cannot have strong growth in our economy if we run these huge debts, these, these huge deficits. That's, that's the fact. And so I, you know, I, I'm very discouraged that having balanced the budget, having achieved a surplus in the budget, having spilt a lot of blood, political blood, in the process of doing that, that within a few years that was thrown out the window and we are now back in high deficits uh, with a huge debt and are gonna have to do this all over again because frankly, our economy is not gonna be strong unless we have fiscal discipline. Well, you know, as we talked about it, I became, he appointed me OMB director, uh, director of the Office of Management and Budget. And I, I enjoyed that job. We, had, we put together, to his credit, a, a very tough budget that included deficit reduction, almost $500 billion in deficit reduction. Uh, and I think because of that budget and, and other budgets that we had worked on, uh, that's how we achieved that, that balanced budget. And, uh, and I, can re I can remember at some point uh, that, I think it was Al Gore, who was a classmate of mine in the Congress, he was vice president, uh, came up to me and said, you know, Leon, uh, the president's thinking of appointing you as uh, chief of staff. And, and I said uh, to Al, I said, Al, I said, uh, you know, I think the White House, the operation of the White House is chaotic. Uh, there was very little discipline. There was no kind of clear chain of command. I'd go to meetings in the White House, and there sometimes would be 30 or 40 people in those meetings, everybody talking, nothing coming out of it, no, no decision. Uh, there were a number of people, uh, similar to what, what's happened in this administration, of people who were appointed who had kind of these general titles, uh, consultant to the president, counselor to the president, but they had no specific responsibilities. These were people who just basically walked in uh, to a meeting, said things, and then walked out and had no responsibility. So I said to, to Gore, I said, you know, I don't think so. I don't think I want that job. And, uh, and Al said, they really do need you uh, to do that. So the next thing I know, I'm being called up to uh, Camp David. Uh, and they, they invite me to a meeting at Camp David. And I fly up with the vice president and his wife to uh, Camp David, go to the president's cabin up there. And uh, we walk in, I walk in, and it's Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Al Gore and Tipper Gore and me. And I thought, boy, am I screwed uh, as a result of that. I mean, I, they're going to come in hard for me to, to uh, take the job of chief of staff. So uh, the president says, I really need you to take this job. I, I need you to provide that discipline. And I said, Mr. President, look, we've just passed your budget. We're passing appropriations bills. It's really an important legacy. You're, everything you've done on the budget is important. I think I'm really important to you as OMB director to uh, continue to work on that. Uh, and uh, I, I think you need me more in that job as OMB director. And I never forgot what he said. <laughs> Bill Clinton, he looked at me and he said, you know, Leon, you can be the greatest OMB director in the history of the world but nobody's going to remember you if the White House is falling apart. <laughs> and I never forgot that. And I said, all right, you got the president. I said, I'll do this, but I'll do this 
only if I have your support. I need the support of Hillary. I need the support of the vice president. Uh, I really do need to have uh, the support because the, you know, there's a lot that needs to be done. And so I remember going back to the White House. Uh, you, know, you wonder if you made the right decision, but I said, OK, I'll, I'm going to do this. And uh, I went to my predecessor, a nice guy named Mac McClarty. And I said, Mac, I said, I need, a, I need an organization chart for the White House. And he said, he thought about it, and he says, you know, Leon, I don't believe I have one of those. <laughs> I thought, oh, man, am I in trouble. So I have to, I've got to, now I've got to basically put an organization chart together. And uh, frankly, I relied a lot more on my military experience almost than anything. I, I started with an organization chart. Chief of staff, deputy chiefs of staff, who's responsible to who. Uh, I, I, I developed control over who went into the Oval Office uh, discipline there. I required everybody to come through me. Uh, I participated in every meeting, so I knew what was going on. Uh, I, I really uh, developed a lot of discipline within the White House. And to the president's credit, uh, the president wanted to do that. He knew that uh, the White House was not operating well. And, and so he was willing to give me the authority to be able to do what I felt needed to be done, uh, to, to move s some staff people out. To uh, I, I got rid of all of these floating consuls to the president. I said, we don't need them. If they're gonna, if they're gonna, if they're gonna work in the White House, they have to have a specific responsibility so that I know that they're doing what uh, needs to be done. It's tough, particularly when you just kind of walk into the White House and all these people have kind of developed their little areas of power. They've all kind of tried to figure out how they could advance their own career careers and their own egos. And suddenly you're walking in there as the uh, chief uh, law enforcement <laughs> officer and uh, you're trying to tell them what to do. And you know, you, there are a lot of knives out and I remember you know, bringing my staff with me to the White House. I brought some key people with me because I wanted people to watch my back while all these knives were out. But I also realized that, and by the way, I, this is a question I often get about. When you take over OMB or CIA or Department of Defense, how the hell do you make it work? <laughs> and the key to it is that you really have to build a team that are working together. And I, I really do believe you have to be honest, honest with yourself about who you are, what your strengths and weaknesses are. I have experience in government. I know a lot of these issues by virtue of my own experience. Uh, I have the discipline to make sure that people are doing their job. Uh, and I don't mind being honest with, with people. I, it's not just a question of being honest with yourself. It's being honest with others and having them understand that what you're telling them is the truth. And that uh, once you do that, and once they feel like they're part of a team, and, and by the way, the other key here is to set goals. Every job I've been in, I have set goals as to what I wanted to achieve. Uh, and you set goals, you work with others to set those goals, they become part of a team to achieve those goals, and once you create that sense that you really are all part of a team, it's amazing how people come together Well, I mean the fact is uh, John Kelly uh, is who uh, obviously been named chief of staff, um, is a good friend. He's a guy who uh, worked for me at the Defense Department as my military aide. Uh, I know John very well. Uh, and John, when he was appointed to that job, called me and said, uh, what the hell do I do? Because uh, you know, he, he knew that it's the kind of chaos we talked about where you know, people are running around, no chain of command, no, uh, no order, uh, and, uh, and no discipline. And I said, uh, I said, John, in many ways, what you're facing is very similar to what I faced in the Clinton administration. Uh, and you've got you to gotta do the following. You've got to establish a strong chain of command with you at the top. 
Uh, you've got to have strong deputies. You have to have staff people who are responsible to supervisors. You cannot just have people floating around. They've got to be reporting to people. So you establish a strong chain of command. You have to establish a process of decision making. Uh, that follows uh, an orderly process in the national security system and in the uh, domestic policy system as well. How do you develop policy and options for the president so that those options are presented to the president, the president can make the decision? Because you're facing a ton of, of crises. So you need to have a process to deal with that and present those options to the president. It's a uh, triage. You've got to basically, you're, you're being hit by all kinds of crises uh, by, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of blood all over the place, political blood all over the place, and you've got to deal with it, and you've got to put it in an order in order to confront it. You cannot just run around. You can't, I mean, if you don't have that, then people all run around like chickens with their heads cut off. And you cannot have chaos in the White House. You can't govern by chaos. So you've got to bring, bring some order to that, and you've got to stay focused. I mean, it's very much, I mean, in the military, frankly, if you have a mission to take the hill, and you're suddenly taking incoming fire and there's all kinds of explosions going on around you, you've got to deal with that, but you've got to stay focused on the mission. And it's very true in the White House. You're going to be dealing with all kinds of explosions going on, but you've got to stay focused on the mission. So the real issue is whether or not President Trump wants that discipline, whether he wants to abide by that. And if he does, then you can get some order restored. If he doesn't, if he makes the decision he is not going to be confined to any process, he's going to basically do whatever tweeting he wants to do or say whatever he wants to say, then uh, I think they're going to continue to have some serious problems. Well, this was, uh, I mean, this was the, uh, the Clinton White House. And uh, I think what was happening was that uh, uh, the Clintons were going to uh, leave on vacation. Uh, and uh, we were kind of, uh, you know, wanted to, to send them off. And so uh, Harold Ickes, who was one of my deputies, I had two great deputies, uh, er, uh, Bowles, uh, Erskine Bowles, uh, who was uh, one of my deputies responsible for personnel uh, and for uh, scheduling. And then uh, Ickes, who was uh, responsible for working on issues and also working on political uh, matters as well. And uh, Ickes suggested that uh, we get some horses from the, uh, uh, from the uh, service there, the uh, uh, Interior Department, uh, Park Service. Uh, they've got a number of horses they use uh, to watch the parks in, in Washington. And that uh, we go riding uh, in, uh, because I think the Clintons were going to go to, uh, it was either Montana, I think it was Montana or Wyoming, I can't remember. Uh, and uh, they were going to Rockefeller's, <laughs> Rockefeller's house, I believe it was in Wyoming, uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Anyway, uh, so we thought, you know, doing the, the whole Western thing would be, would be fun. So we all had cowboy hats and we had jeans on and our boots. And we rode these horses up to uh, the president and wished him well. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's probably some I can't talk about, but <laughs> that they're, you know, you've got it. You know, uh, it's really important. You know, we're talking about the White House, talking about these other things, but I think, particularly in the White House, that it's very easy to lose sight of your humanity. And very frankly, when you lose sight of your humanity, it, make, it makes you less of a leader. And so the ability to kind of stay in touch with humanity and, and being able to, to laugh, and being able to enjoy uh, people and enjoy experiences, it's that human part of what all of us are about. And the ability to stay in touch with that, I think is really important, particularly for presidents of the United States, to stay in touch with the human side of life. Uh, it just makes them a better person. And so we used to do all kinds of things, you know, with the, with the president. Uh, and, and he enjoyed it. He used to, I mean, 
he and Hillary uh, enjoyed social life. They had a lot of parties at the White House. We brought a lot of uh, musicians to the White House. We had uh, all kinds of, uh, of great events. I came back, uh, you know, got the president reelected, uh, and then I decided it was time to come back home. And uh, we did, and Sylvia and I started an institute for public policy, the Panetta Institute, and we really enjoyed it. We were working at it, trying to inspire young people to get involved in public life. And uh, I, I really did not think about uh, even the possibility of going back to Washington. So I get this call after, uh, Obama's elected from uh, John Podesta. And he said, you know, we're thinking about you for CIA director. And there was that silence. And I said, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, because, you know, I'd worked on budgets. I'd worked on, I'd worked on ocean issues. Uh, you know, I uh, was chairman of an oceans commission. I, I did some work on what was called the Iraq study group uh, with uh, uh, Jim Baker and uh, uh, Lee Hamilton uh, chaired that group. We actually went to Iraq, and I really enjoyed that. Um, but, you know, my, my background was really not in intelligence, although I'd been an intelligence officer in the Army. Uh, and I said, what's this about? He, he said, uh, the president thinks that you can help restore the trust of the CIA. And, I, you know, I thought about that. Uh, I was still nervous about, you know, whether it was something that really was a good fit. But then when the president called and made the point again that he really felt that uh, I could restore uh, the trust of it, I, you know, and I said to the president, I said, look, Mr. President, um, I'm going to, if I take this job, I am going to present you with the intelligence that you're going to need to make some very tough decisions. That's what the CIA is all about. And I said, I'm going to give you the truth, whether you like it or not, because I think it's going to be very important that any decisions you have to be made are based on the truth of what's happening. Well, that was, that was a real blow. I mean, I, look. Obviously, we were, we were very involved in going after al-Qaeda, uh, the leadership of al-Qaeda, uh, which at that point, a lot of those leaders were located in Pakistan. Uh, we were looking at other sensitive parts of the world. Uh, but our, one of our main focuses, too, was uh, trying to capture bin Laden. Uh, we had no idea where the hell bin Laden was. So we had, for the first time, uh, an opportunity to try to get close to somebody to, to uh, the person who was second in authority to bin Laden. And the Jordanians came to me and said, we think we've got uh, a great uh, agent uh, who could work for you. He's a doctor. And uh, we think he, he can get access into uh, the Fatah, which is the tribal area in Pakistan. And that because uh, Zawahiri, who was uh, second in command to bin Laden, uh, had some health problems, that he would seek the advice of this doctor, and that would help you locate uh, number two in al-Qaeda. We thought that's great. So we set up a meeting in a place called Host Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, the, uh, we had a number of officers there to vet this person, to make sure that this person could really do this job and that we could trust them. And so uh, that person, uh, they finally set up a meeting and that person drove up in a car uh, in this little compound uh, in uh, the Afghanistan, host, which is near the border with uh, Pakistan. And uh, the person got out of the car on the, on, instead of getting out on the side that was closest to where people were, he got out on the other side. And the security people immediately got around him. And they said, uh, take your hands out of your, uh, your garment. And he wouldn't do it. And they, they, they started to cock their weapons. And uh, at that point, uh, he obviously pulled the trigger on a suicide vest bomb that was very powerful. Uh, the explosion, uh, I, mean, I remember going there. You could see some of the uh, 
the remnants of that bomb almost 100 yards away. Uh, and it killed seven of our officers and wounded a number of others. And that was, it was a real blow. I don't think we've, we had lost that many officers uh, in one explosion since uh, I think losing, uh, having one of the embassies getting blown up in, uh, in Lebanon. You don't, you don't realize how, how hard it is until you go to seven funerals. Uh, and meet with the families of the people who have lost their loved ones. And yet, at the same time, every one of those families came up to me and said, uh, my loved one was doing what they, they loved to do. And I want to make sure that you do everything possible to continue the mission that they were involved with. And when family members say that, you really do take that to heart. And uh, I remember going back and sharing that with people at the CIA. And everybody became that much more enthused about really making sure we went after uh, bin Laden. And uh, that, that's exactly what happened, is that there was even a greater commitment to seeing if we could find uh, bin Laden. You know, I, when, I, when I became a CIA director uh, and I went to, uh, uh, to my predecessor, uh, Mike Hayden, uh, I mean, Hayden, you know, we talked about intelligence responsibilities and uh, developing intelligence sources, et cetera. And then he looked at me and he said, you know, he said, you're also going to be a combatant commander. I said, what the hell are you talking about? And he described uh, the operations that we were involved with. Uh, and I, I suddenly realized he was absolutely right. I was a combatant commander. We were using uh, our capabilities to target Al-Qaeda's leadership. And we were using something that was new and effective technology uh, in, in war. And uh, look, I mean, let's understand. When 9-11 happens and our country is attacked by Al-Qaeda and 3,000 people are killed in this country, we went to war. We went to war uh, to go after those who had uh, attacked our country. And you know, we go after them in Afghanistan, but they eventually make their way uh, and escape into Pakistan. So our enemy, people that are planning another 9-11 type attack, are operating in Pakistan. Normally, if you have an enemy, you can take an F-16 or a B-2 bomber and go in and blow them up. Uh, you couldn't do that in Pakistan because Pakistan wouldn't allow us to do that. Or you take troops, special forces, and put them on the ground and go after people. Couldn't do that either in Pakistan because they wouldn't let us do it. So we have an enemy that's planning an additional attack in this country. How do you go after them? You have to use the kind of technology that we had the ability uh, to, to use, which is to target people and then to go after them. And we did it effectively. And it is a precise technology. It is, uh, it is something that requires a tremendous amount of surveillance. There's mistakes ever in war in a number of uh, ways. I mean, people who are in combat make mistakes. But the issue is, are we responsible for protecting the people of this country or aren't we? And are we going to exercise that responsibility in a responsible way? And the fact is, when we went after targets, uh, we made very clear we're not going to fire if there are women or children uh, in the line of fire. And we made that decision. Uh, and it was very precise. And we did undercut uh, the leadership of Al Qaeda. Uh, were there mistakes? Were there innocent people killed? You bet. But what if we had dropped? Uh, an F-16 bomb on a compound. You don't think there would have been collateral damage? You're damn right there would have been collateral damage. If we had used a B-2 bomber to drop a bomb on a, on, a, on a compound, it would have wiped out the whole village. Collateral damage? You're damn right. But if you're just using a single weapon to go after an individual, that's a precise way to go after somebody who's trying to kill Americans. And I think it was effective. You start with the uh, 
the fundamental fact that uh, Iran is an adversary. We shouldn't lose sight of that. Uh, Iran is a troublemaker in the Middle East. Uh, Iran uh, basically uh, uh, provides a, a support system for terrorism uh, in the region. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Israel, uh, the moderate Arab countries in that region, the United States all recognize that uh, Iran is an author authoritarian government that is interested in creating instability in the Middle East and in supporting terrorism in the Middle East. They support Hezbollah, they support Hamas, they support terrorism uh, in, in a number of continents across the world. So they're not good guys. Uh, and ma as a matter of fact, a lot of the uh, work we were doing, the operations we were doing at CIA was targeting uh, Iran uh, to try to make sure that they would never get uh, an atomic weapon, a uh, nuclear weapon. So. I think that uh, you know, having imposed those sanctions on Iran, having brought them to the negotiating table, uh, I think that the United States could have been a lot tougher in terms of the other elements that should have been part of the deal. I mean, I think we should have used that deal to go after their support for terrorism uh, and their uh, development of missiles and other steps that they were taking. But at the same time, they, they were able to get a deal that in the very least uh, postponed their ability to get a nuclear weapon and provided enough checks and balances in the process to make sure that that wouldn't happen. I, don't, I think as a result of that and the fact that there are other countries that uh, support that deal, that we shouldn't walk away from it, that we should continue to enforce it, and that we should continue to determine whether or not is, Iran is enforcing that deal as well. Because it's a hell of a lot better at this point in time to try to make sure that Iran doesn't get a nuclear weapon than just simply tearing up that deal and giving them a free ticket to develop a, a nuclear weapon. Oh, I don't think there's any question. Uh, once the president drew that line, and I, I frankly thought it was the right line to draw. There you, you know, they have chemical weapons. Uh, these are weapons that are, uh, that are brutal. That, are, uh, that violate international law. Uh, and I think it was important for the president to say, you know, we're not going to accept the use of, of chemical weapons uh, by, by, this, by Assad. And so it, it, I thought it was important. Anyway, once the president of the United States sets that line, that red line, that becomes the word of the United States of America. And I think when that line is crossed, you have a responsibility to enforce that red line. I think the failure to uh, enforce that red line uh, and to, uh, you know, to not hit them uh, as we should have at the, at the point sent a, sent a terrible message, not only to, uh, to our enemies that, uh, our word was not worth much, but it also sent a bad message to our allies as to whether or not uh, our word could be depended upon. Uh, and that, I think, weakened, it weakened the United States. And I think as a result of that, I wouldn't be surprised if Putin read that message to become a lot more aggressive uh, in going into the Ukraine and going into Syria and doing the things that Putin did. Uh, so I think, I think it is very important that when the United States, and particularly when the President of the United States establishes any kind of red line, and you could argue whether this was the right red line to establish, but once you do that, you've got to back it up. Look, I, I think we're living at a time when there are there are more flashpoints in the world of uh, 2017, 21st century. More flashpoints, I think, than probably since the end of World War II. Uh, I think if, there's, if you could compare it to anything, it's probably that period in, in 1914. I mean, I think people ought to reread The Guns of August, uh, Barbara Tuckman's book, about how uh, world leadership failed to really come to grips with all of the crises that were going on that ultimately led to World War I. 
uh, because I, that's what I worry about in today's world. Uh, you know, we've got, we've got flashpoints uh, with, uh, we're still conducting a war on terrorism against uh, Al Qaeda, ISIS. Uh, we are dealing with failed states in the Middle East, in Syria, in Libya, uh, and others, uh, breeding grounds for terrorism. We're dealing with Iran, uh, which continues to be a threat. We're dealing with North Korea and the possibility that they could develop an ICBM with a nuclear weapon. Uh, we're dealing with Russia being much more aggressive, a whole new chapter of the Cold War. We're dealing with China making territorial claims in the South China Sea. We're dealing with cyber attacks. That's the whole new battlefield of the future. Uh, you know, we saw it happen uh, during the election, but the reality is you could use cyber to paralyze a country. So there's a lot of flashpoints out there. And the real question is, is the United States going to provide world leadership to deal with all of those flashpoints? I mean, in recent years, there's been this attitude that somehow, you know, we've, we fought wars in Afghanistan and, and uh, Iraq. Uh, we need to kind of pull back from the world. Other, other countries in the world need to step up and deal with these problems. But the reality is that if the United States doesn't provide leadership on these issues, nobody else will. And our national security will be threatened as a result of that. So this is a point where the United States has to provide world leadership. And my greatest concern right now is whether or not the United States is going to provide that leadership in a world that is facing an increasingly large number of dangerous flashpoints. What worries me is that uh, you know, if the United States is not smart enough to provide uh, strong leadership, that uh, North Korea could very well develop an ICBM with a miniaturized nuclear weapon that could literally attack the United States of America. I'm worried that uh, a Russia uh, that senses weakness on the part of the United States uh, could make the decision not just to go into the Ukraine, uh, but to go into other former Soviet Union states uh, and try to assert uh, control over those states. I'm worried about China, but most importantly, as I said, I am worried about our enemies getting a hold of a cyber weapon that could literally paralyze this country. Those are all fears that involve the safety and the security of the United States of America. you damn right I do. Uh, I've, always found, uh, I've always found Hail Marys to be a great refuge when you're facing uh, tough decisions and crises of one kind or another. I mean, I, you know, I, I believe deeply in my faith, uh, and uh, I have always found uh, strength in that faith, uh, you know, in, in these, these very tough situations. And... You know, I, I really do believe uh, in, in, in the power of, of faith having an impact uh, on the course of things in this world. But I also know, I mean, I, there's, a, there's a great story that I tell that I think makes the point very well. A uh, Jesuit told me this about a rabbi and the priest who decided they would get to know each other a little better. And so they decided to go to events and decided they, if by going to events they could talk and they'd learn about each other's faith. So they go to a boxing match. And just before the bell rang, one of the boxers makes the sign of the cross. And the rabbi nudges the priest and said, what does that mean? The priest says, it doesn't mean a damn thing if he can't fight. And I think that's something we all need to remember, is that we can bless ourselves with the hope that things are going to be fine, but it frankly doesn't mean a damn thing unless we're willing to fight for it. I've seen in my almost 50 years of public life, I've seen Washington at its best and I've seen Washington at its worst. Uh, the good news is I've seen Washington work. I've seen Republicans and Democrats work together on issues. Um, when I got elected to Congress, Tip O'Neill was the speaker, Bob Michael was the minority leader. They were willing to work together. Did they have their political differences? Of course. But they worked together on issues. And that's how our democracy functions. That's how we are able to govern uh, and deal with the challenges that we face is when 
people are willing to come together, regardless of party, regardless of ideology, and work together, find consensus, find compromise, and get things done. That is what the heart and soul of our democracy is all about. And today, uh, you know, I, I've never seen Washington as partisan, as divided, and as dysfunctional as it is today. Uh, you know, the parties are in their trenches. They don't want to come out of the trenches. They don't want to work together on all of these issues that confront us, whether it's the debt, whether it's funding infrastructure, whether it's immigration reform, whether it's tax reform, uh, all of these myriad of, of important issues uh, that, that need to be dealt with. So I think the great challenge we face is whether or not we are going to find the leadership to get back to, to a process of governing. I think we're in a period of crisis and we're depending on crisis. We govern by crisis. Uh, Congress doesn't, doesn't really want to do anything unless uh, we're, we're almost ready to walk off a cliff, unless we're in a deep crisis. And then they just kick the can down the road rather than solving it. Mm -hmm. so, so we're governing by crisis. And I, I, there's a price to be paid for that. And the price is you lose the trust of the American people in our system of governing. And if you want to know the lesson from uh, the 2016 election, it's the lesson of a lot of angry and frustrated people who felt that a dysfunctional Washington was not working for them, not dealing with the problems they were facing. And so, you know, even though they had this rather bizarre candidate who had no experience, they decided to go with somebody that uh, they thought could blow up things in Washington. Uh, that by itself is not going to solve these problems. You still need leadership. I think we are at a point where we can take one of two paths as a country in the 21st century. I think one path is that we really could be in America in Renaissance in the 21st century. Uh, we could have a very strong economy. We've got great creativity and innovation. Uh, I sit on the board of Oracle up in Silicon Valley. I've never seen uh, so many bright ideas about uh, things that could be developed for the future. Uh, I think we could uh, teach our kids the, you know, the skills they need for the 21st century. We could have an agile defense force. We could be a world leader. That could be the kind of America that we could have. Or the other choice is that we could be an American decline, uh, an America that is dysfunctional, that can't govern, that uh, de depends on crisis, governs by crisis after crisis after crisis. And if that happens, I think our country, like empires throughout history, will slowly spiral down uh, and will decline. So the real challenge is going to be what path do we take? And, and that, the answer to that question rests on the leadership that we have. Because if leadership relies on those values that are important to what this country is all about, then I think we can we can find the right path. The key for me uh, in all the different jobs I've had and all the different challenges that I've faced is a real sense that there is no such thing as the impossible, that you can always achieve what your goals are if you work at it and if you're committed to it and if you believe in the fact that deep down this country is good, deep down the American people really want to do the right thing for themselves and for their families. And if you can appeal to that sense of goodness and that sense of hope, uh, you really can get things done. Uh, our democracy can work. Our forefathers developed a system of government in which you really can uh, serve the dignity of every individual and make their lives better. And uh, I just think if you believe deeply enough in what this country's all about, you can get the job done. Well, you know, I saw it with my son uh, when, he, when he ran for Congress. 
Uh, and now he's a, you know, he's, he's a member of the house. And you know, he loves the camaraderie, he loves the, the collegiality of working with others, but he's frustrated because there's an unwillingness to deal with uh, a lot of these issues. But they're doing something about it. You know, one, of the, one of the things that, have give, that has given me hope is that uh, he, he is a veteran. He, he fought in uh, Afghanistan. And there are a number of veterans that have been elected, both Republican and Democrat. And these guys are going back there and they're saying, wait a minute, we, we fought for this country and now we're back in Washington and these people don't want to solve problems? That's, that's not for me. So there's now a, a solutions caucus that my son is a part of, made up of about 22 Democrats, 22 Republicans. And they are beginning to work together on issues. I think that's how things ultimately are going to change. This is not going to change from the top down. I wish it would. It would be better if the president and leadership of the Congress decided we've got to govern. I'm not sure that's going to happen. But I do think from the bottom up, from these newer members that are getting elected and really are committed to trying to find solutions, that probably is what can save our democracy. I love music. I played the piano. I was, my mother wanted me to be a concert pianist. Uh, and uh, I decided that wasn't quite for me, but I continue to enjoy uh, music. I play classical music, uh, but I enjoy all kinds of music. I enjoy good food. I enjoy life. I enjoy my wife, and I enjoy my family. It's, uh, those are all things that really make life worthwhile. When I have a sense that uh, things are screwed up, and I, you know, I'm just not sure whether or not we'll find an answer, I, the thing I do is usually sit at the piano and I play a song by Beethoven called Paralise, which is probably the most soothing music I can play for myself because it is, it not only soothes your, your, your concerns, but there is a certain sense that for all the problems that are going on, uh, life can be beautiful. <laughs>